Astros have emerged in the Blake Snell sweepstakes after some unfortunate injuries to their starting rotation. We're going to talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to go ahead and get into a, an article that was written by Joel Sherman for the New York Post about the Seattle Mariners offseason, and we're going to cap it all off with my spring training tell-all, telling you everything that happened while I was down in spring training, because it was a doozy. Thank you guys so much for watching episode 70 of the Hit It Here podcast, part of the Believe Network, the Brandon Bernardino episode of the podcast, and I'm here with Joe. Joe, how are you? Making a stank face at Brandon Bernardino getting dropped on the pod. Happy about that in a, in, in a weird way. So something I'm not happy about, segues are fun. Blake Snell being an Astro is was in just bad. Bad vibes I mean, all around. Obviously nothing is... Gross. Yeah, nothing has really developed since the initial... Oh, Jose Arquiti is, you know, getting pulled from his game because he immediately pointed at his elbow oh it's done and then like Verlander's obviously behind schedule there was JP France who was behind schedule so the Astros rotation is looking a little bleak and obviously there are two big name free agencies in the free agent pool still Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery and if I was a betting man with the news that came out recently I'm betting on the fact that Blake Snell's probably going to be an Astro I don't want to I don't want to deal with that but quickly a word from Bet Online. With the Soul Series right around the corner and opening day for the rest of the teams around baseball shortly after, you need to get in your bets for the win loss projections soon. And the best place to do that is Bet Online. So, whether or not you're betting under on the Yankees after the Garrett Cole injury, Bet Online is your place to do it. And if you're not super interested in betting baseball right now, basketball is still available to you and bet online continues to be your number one source for all the basketball wagering needs including pro and even college hoops even though march madness is ongoing and we're close to wrapping that up the nba is still there and it's leading into the playoffs and with up to the minute odds stats and trends you can follow your favorite teams in the nba's path to the playoffs with in-game live betting contests and all the best player props Experience the world's best wagering platform anytime for your desktop or your mobile devices and head to Bet Online today to become part of the team and remember to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, the game starts here. So the most recent news that's come out between the Astros and Blake Snell is the fact that they're balking at his price. They do not want to pay $33 million a year. The recent, you know, Number, you know, the figure that's been thrown out is two years, 66 million with an opt out after two years. And so then that's begging the question. I know Mariners fans all over Twitter are like, oh, would he go for two years, 44, or two years, 50? What's the hometown discount going to look like? It doesn't matter. The Mariners, we are so far removed from the situation. I feel like that it shouldn't matter unless we want to play the biggest spoiler of all time and just go sign them to say, screw the Astros. That's the only way that I see it happening. But realistically, like, that's just out of the window. I would have preferred another in division, you know, in the division team to go sign them, the Angels. I would have preferred that over the Astros because adding Blake Snell, a two-time Cy Young winner for a reason, to the Astros team, that would make them better. Like, realistically, it's going to make them better. The rotation as it stands right now is Framber Valdez, Christian Javier, Hunter Brown, Ronel Blanco, yeah, oh. that's a name, oh. and JP okay. France. That's according to roster resource. Obviously, you add in Blake Snell into that, you get Justin Verlander back at the end of May or, you know, end of April, whatever. Maybe your Kitty comes back. France is, you know, there's a lot of question marks. But if you add Blake Snell into that, unfortunately, that is a really solid pitching staff. One through four until, like, Verlander's back. Then one through five is, like, you're good. And... With how the Astros' bullpen is also kind of set up, the fact that Blake Snell only goes five or six innings, you're fine. Because Abreu, Presley, Hayter are your back-end three. You've, they've still got Montero, who had a down year last year. Like, Brandon Bielek's still in their bullpen. Like, obviously, you know, Bielek's not, like, the greatest name. But there's names in the pen for the way Blake Snell pitches. It's not going to be that big of a detriment to that Astros team. Colton, if he were to sign with the Astros on a scale of one to 10, like what's your panic meter? Like as far as the Mariners, like, I guess like, I don't want to say chances at like the division. Cause like, it's never a guarantee, but how much further would that put the Astros? Would you say ahead? If it does put them ahead. I personally still think that the Mariners rotation would be better. Okay. Plain and simple. I think the Mariners rotation, even after adding Blake Snell is better simply because there are a lot of problems when it comes to Blake Snell. I think that 
his walk rate is something that the all the teams should be concerned about. And honestly, the amount of money that he wants and the fact that nobody is jumping at that offer kind of goes to show the industry's feel for Blake Snell in 2024. Obviously, yes, he is coming back from winning the Cy Young again. But at the same time, there are still those underlying numbers there that say he has trouble finding the strike zone. I like Blake Snell as much as everybody else, but I think that if he was to sign with the Astros, A, I'd be sad, because obviously he's a Seattle guy who loves the Mariners. But B, I think that my panic level would say, okay, they added the reigning Cy Young for the National League, but they haven't really done a whole lot else this offseason. Obviously, they did add Josh Hader as well, so they kind of fortified their uh, their pitching staff and as a whole. I still think I take the Mariners pitching staff over that at full strength. I think that Verlander's on the wrong side of 40 now. <laughs> Old is there, man. Yeah. Is there a right side of 40? Um, I think that JP France, who knows, coming into next year, you know, kind of where he's at in his throwing program. Framber was very hit or miss last year, in my opinion. I think that he was one of those guys I expected to have a much better year in 2023 than he actually did. And same with Christian Javier, a guy yeah. who I think we've expected to kind of take over the mantle as one of the better pitchers in the league, and he hasn't done that. But even after all this smoke seemingly blown up, I'd say, by the Astros and maybe Scott Boris? Maybe? Probably. Probably. Uh, the Astros are probably out. Um, they're going to be over, you know, the tax threshold, like, pretty significantly if they added Snell at 30 even like under that, they're probably going to be in that luxury, like the luxury tax. So it's like, it's not very realistic for Blake Snell to go to the Astros just based on the premise of like money. It's just not, not in the cards for them. So even with, you know, the potential, it's kind of scary. I don't, and a lot of people would say it's probably not going to happen. And that the most realistic suitor, the San Francisco Giants, I'd say probably the most ideal situation for the Mariners, you know, keeps him, out of the AL, especially out of the division. Sure, it's the NL West, so it's, like, pretty close, but, like, we only play the Giants once, so, like, who really cares? The Giants are the favorites, as it stands right now. I think that the Giants rotation, adding Blake Snell, first of all, for the Giants, that'd be, honestly, pretty solid, because mm -hmm. they obvi they already have Logan Webb, they have Kyle Harrison, they have Robbie Ray coming back eventually. Adding Blake Snell to that, like, the potential for that rotation, there there's a there's a potential that's one of the best rotations in baseball if Very, you add Blake Snell. Yeah, if, like, and, if they're all peaking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that that would be best-case scenario. If the Astros do, don't want to go over the luxury tax, yes. Then when you look at the Angels, why would they sign a guy to, like, a $33 million contract for one year when they weren't really even in on Shohei? Mm -hmm. So I think that Blake Snell... And I, it makes me wonder if he's going to drop his asking price even more because... As we get even closer to opening day, is he willing then to drop it to another, you know, however, like maybe he's willing to drop another 10. Like you, like you said, people were saying for the Mariners earlier, maybe he's willing to do like a low twenties, like on a one-year deal or something like that. I think high AAV for one year makes more sense yeah. for a deal for Blake Snell at this point. And, but obviously he is looking for, he, what he, in a perfect world for him, it'd be decent AAV with a longer term contract. But at this point in the game, it's just not going to happen. So I think that, or maybe, maybe maybe a team tries to defer, and maybe that's how a deal gets done with the Astros. Maybe maybe mm. they want to defer like some of his money over the next couple of years, so they're not hitting the luxury tax this year. So I don't know. I think that there's a lot of different ways that this could go. The fact that we're sitting here on March 18th and Blake Snell has not signed anywhere is really bad for baseball, in my opinion. But I just pray to God it's not the friggin' Astros. However, you did talk a little bit about the Mariners signing him just to spoil it. Yeah. <laughs> God, that'd be funny. That would be so good. It'd be so stupid, but it'd be so funny. I wouldn't have any confidence in the fact that it was John Stanton that had orchestrated that move. Like, it could be Jerry's head if that move does get made. You know what I mean? Like, it'd be like a, his dying wish to just screw the Astros and then, like, sign Blake Snell. And then John <laughs> Stanton's like, you didn't have that money, so goodbye. Right. Like, obviously, that's just a big hypothetical. But that would be that would be a very big turn of events, especially on... In the middle of March, a week away from games, like this guy that the Mar everyone in the Mariners community has been like, yo, he's interested. Why not just give it a shot? Whatever. Figure it out. And then you wait like four months and then you finally sign him. It would just be very, it would be kind of funny, ultimately. And I don't know what that would mean. 
for the Mariners rotation because obviously then probably one of Wu or Miller are expendable. Yeah. And obviously the Mariners don't want to do that. So let's not even start to talk about this <laughs> actually happening because <laughs> then I, I can just see the comments now saying, well, maybe they should do it then. It's I mean, not going to happen. They're probably mad at us that we talked about the Astros for about 10 minutes to start a pod, a Mariners podcast. You're right. You know what? Heck the Astros, Joe. Let's yeah. move on. Heck them. To an article. <laughs> That's not any better. <laughs> about in regards to the Mariners stance in terms of you know public media Joel Sherman East Coast writer for the New York Post says that the Mariners should have done more this offseason should have tried to make themselves better in this window of opportunity I don't disagree with the sentiment it's the the phrasing and the the way he went about it that seems short-sighted from like the media in that way like obviously if you've been paying attention to the Mariners you know the handcuffs that have been placed on this team by the ownership group. The, the main point of this article, and I'll let you kind of explain it a bit more, Colton, is the, the Gregory Santos deal, where obviously the Mariners traded Prelander Baroa. Well, I kind of said that name too fast. Prelander Baroa, Zach Deloach, and then like a draft pick, which is probably the 69th <laughs> nice <laughs> pick. Nice. And could we have done more in that trade? And we kind of mentioned that in the last podcast when we we're talking about Dylan Cease going to the Padres, like what a trade like that would have looked like. And Joel Sherman suggests in this article that the Mariners should have also tried to snag Luis Robert Jr. from the White Sox. Which is just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It was never going to happen. Like, just, I don't know why Joel Sherman's even mentioning that. It's just not feasible. Yeah, the, the, the package would have looked so much different, obviously. Like, you would have had to have been throwing in guys like Cole Young and Colt Emerson and Laz and whatnot. I think that whatever Joel Sherman's smoking, I, I understand, yes, the Mariners' window of opportunity is now. You have a great pitching staff. You have Julio. Obviously, you have Cal and JP. Yes, you have all those things. They're all relatively cheap compared to what they will be in the future. You have to understand that those players are not as easy to acquire as they would be in MLB The Show. Right, Joe? Dude. The show? <laughs> MLB The Show. And I think that <laughs> the Sherman was like, yeah, you got you got to keep the Chris Getz and the White Sox on a loop. It's like they're, they're going to tell you no immediately. And then if you keep calling them, you're not getting Santos either. Mm -hmm. Sorry. They're going to be like, no, heck you. Like, And I understand that, yes, maybe this expands to more than just Robert. Obviously, they could be talking about a Rosa Reina and Isak Paredes, just two guys randomly that I'm throwing out there from the Rays. Yeah. And other guys we talked about throughout the offseason, of course, Reds, infielders, etc. But what we've seen from the team so far this spring, I don't think that, honestly, those moves would have made this team so much better that it would have put them over the top. Of course, every team needs a guy like Mookie Betts in their lineup. But the, it's, it's so impossibly hard to acquire those guys, especially with the expanded playoffs, that it's just not feasible. We would we would have needed force trades on, you know, yes. like that. That is yeah. that is the I think the the baseline is for a trade to not feel like we're going to be, you know, regretting it in two, three years time. You have to be able to, quote unquote, fleece the White Sox in this situation. Mm -hmm. And they know what they have. With Robert Jr. Like they have to know. So, Joe, let me ask you this. Yes. If the Mariners would have made one more move that would have appeased Joel Sherman. What You don't have to give me a name, but just like a, a position to fill. What do you think would have made Joel Sherman not put the Mariners on this list? I think given the uncertainty, I guess, with like the, the, produ like the productivity that you're going to get from the corner outfield spots, I think you could probably kind of figure that out with acquiring, say, I'm, I'll give you a name. You already said it, but like a Rose Arena could have been a name that you go out and acquire instead of Luke Rayleigh, right? Instead, you say you don't make the Luke Rayleigh trade for Jose Caballero. Say you do Caballero and like another prospect or something, like a, like a higher end prospect, realistically, for a Rosarena. And then your outfield of, you know, potential big regression buff is now f like filled with a 2020, pretty consistent 2020 presence. Defense isn't great, but like a polarizing figure in the MLB in terms of, you know, stance and stature. A Rosarena would have been a good fit, I think, and could have maybe moved the needle a bit more for, for Sherman here. I don't think you can acquire Rayleigh and a Rosarena without 
really having to give up a ton, but it is the raise. Like we did get Rayleigh for just Caballero. So like, what does that say about what it would have cost for a, a Rosarena? But I think the outfield's probably where you're looking. Like Sherman does mention like the Robbie Ray and like Mitch Haniger trade, but it is very much so kind of just like a, a neutral opinion. Just like the overarching history of the off season with that trade. So it's not really like diving too deep into what the presence of Mitch Haniger is. But I think if you added in someone that's more proven than Luke Rayleigh on the other side of the corner outfield spot, Sherman probably feel better. And I think that part of what Sherman is saying is probably ringing true right now with Mariners fans is because of how poorly Rayleigh has played so far this spring. Poor guy. Like I think that he's just going to be like, he might end up being the punching bag for this article. Like obviously we know that the probably biggest hole for the Mariners could end up being third base, depending on what happens with Rojas and Urias, whether Urias is healthy enough to start the season on the major league roster and whatnot. I don't know. But I think that if Rayleigh continues to underperform, if Urias or Rojas, one of those guys falter, I think that there's some weight behind what Sherman had to say, because yes, the Mariners moved a bunch of money. They went out there and reallocated contra or reallocated money into certain like different areas. I think that because of that, looking at this roster and realizing they didn't make any like huge humongous moves to go out there and get a guy like Luis Robert or Rosa Reina or something like that mm -hmm. is probably what he's getting at here. He's not so much singling out the fact that like they didn't go specifically after Robert. It's more that them not going out and getting another big name guy. Don't get me wrong. Polanco is a great addition in my opinion. Mitch Hanniger is a guy who I think is going to be really good while he's back here. As long as he can stay healthy. Garver is kind of that big name guy. I think when you think of guys who have been more well-known over the past year or so, Garver is probably the most notable guy that they brought in. Uh, him or Polanco. I mean, both of them have been really good. Obviously, Garver was in the World Series, though, so that's what people see. Yeah. I think that his thing is that they just didn't go out there and add another marquee name. But realistically, how many marquee names do we see get moved this offseason? Juan Soto? Like, that was the big one. Obviously, like, Corbin Burns, but why? So... I don't know. Were there any other marquee names that I'm missing? The most recent one's just Dylan Cease, but Dylan Cease, yeah. Know, but again, why? Yeah. We were we were linked to him, but it's just pitching didn't make sense with how the Mariners kind of like continued to orchestrate their offseason and like the moves that they chose to make. So yeah, it would have had to have been an offensive player, but most of those weren't really changing hands this offseason. So Colton, we we've talked yeah. I think enough about some some of the more negative things in the Mariners' life. Mm -hmm. Would you begin your journey through spring training for us? Would you, would you let, let us into your world? My your last, journey. Your last week. So I've been MIA for the last week for good reason. We were, well, I was down in spring training. <laughs> we is a strong and word. <laughs> we, is a, we is a strong word. I was down in spring training and um, a lot of different things happened. Some good, some bad. Joe, where do you want me to start? I think what you should start with is rattling off all the, the little shout outs you should give. So you don't forget about them later. So I met a ton of you while we were down there. And by the way, if we did take a picture together, please send it to our email at marinermojobiz at gmail.com or post it to us on Twitter or Instagram so I can get it printed out and put it on our little wall thing here because uh, a lot of white space on there. But I got to give a shout out to everybody that I met. First off with Evan, I believe that you and I, we met in the... Uh, we met in the Target, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, who was apparently staying one level above us in the hotel. I met him multiple times. Him and, him and the family were super cool. Dustin and Holly met them at Hohokam. It was super great to meet you guys. Then there was Jake, Mary, Lance, Cole, and CJ. Thank you guys for hanging out with me all day. Brennan, Justin, Matt, Courtney, Mitch, and Steve. Thank you guys all for coming and saying hi. There's one person whose name I can't remember. Starbucks guy. <laughs> I am so sorry. I, I, I tried to find you throughout the rest of the week to ask you, but I just couldn't see. I, I did not see you. I was like on the phone when I met you and like I just totally it just like went into my head and then immediately like I lost it. So you Starbucks just, guy. You should have waited for his name to get called out. Wow, you must work at Starbucks. I you know, I'm normally the Starbucks guy around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh real Starbucks guy, not Joe. Um I'm so sorry. If you see this, please comment your name. I love you. So, so bold and so forward. But, you know, it was super cool to meet all of you guys. Jake, you know, we rode the same plane home together. 
So it was just nice to see everybody and have everybody come up and say hi. Oh, Rick Todd. I didn't mention Rick Todd, which I feel like is a good segue into the next point. For those of you that didn't know, um, I was on uh, 1170 KPUG. I was on like a radio station for a little bit, just randomly. It just kind of popped up. I met Rick down there. He works for the radio station and him and Alan, his, uh, his, the podcaster, not podcaster, interviewer guy, he would, they were in a bar across the street from my hotel. And they're like, Hey, you know, we're, we're going live from three to 6 PM. You should stop by. And I didn't stop by the first day, but I stopped by the second day and had a good time kind of talking ball with them. Uh, ran into Ryan Divish while we were there. Divish came on the show as well. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. Just kind of be able to be down there and do that radio show with you guys. And we might be able to do a few more radio spots with Rick and Alan over there at KPUG. Colton, what was your, I'd say, outside of meeting all the peeps, what was your like most fun interaction that you had? My most fun interaction. For those of you guys that have seen or heard or have even been down to Peoria, you know the churro guy. All right. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Joe post a clip in this podcast as well. I'm just going to make you do so much work. Thanks. You know, you know the one, right? I you do. I do know the one. So, his name is Jose. He was um, selling beer, and I I went out and talked to him a little bit, and you know we became best buds. Me and Jose were some BFFs buds. now, and uh, yeah, apparently he's going to be coming up to Seattle at some point this year and selling some beer there as well. So I'm super excited for that. Uh, here's the clip of Churro Guy, me and Churro Guy. So yeah, Jose, you guys know him if you've ever been down there. You've heard him yelling churro. So like, that was good. I think that that was, thank you. I'm really good at rolling my R's. Um, I think that he's like one of the funniest guys that I've met down there. Just super cool to be around. And he's, you know, he kind of brightens everyone's day when he's out there yelling, big tipper or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. So really, really do like Jose. I'm excited to see him up here in Seattle. So that's your favorite. Do you have a runner up? Is there, is there something, something else that may have happened? while you were down there in, in, in Peoria as in a favorite person that I met or maybe just like, like a favorite like a, interaction, a fun interaction, maybe a fun interaction that I'm not proud of. All right. So I went down. What was I doing? I think I was coming back from a, from a game or something. I don't know. I was staying on the third floor. Well, originally I was staying on the fifth floor. That's another story. Staying on the third floor and I get to the elevator. All right. And, um, there's a guy, and he walks up the elevator as well, a young kid. Um, and he looks at my shirt. And I was wearing a Mariner Mojo shirt. And he said, Seattle? Nah. Padres. And he didn't speak great English. So it was like, it, you could tell there was a, like a, a language barrier there. when Because um, I was saying some things. And I could tell he couldn't quite understand me. And I couldn't quite understand him. We got into the elevator. And I'm like, where are you headed? And he just kind of looked at me and said, Yeah. <laughs> And then I was like, what floor? And he goes, oh, five. I took him to five. And then he looks at me again. And he goes, from Seattle? And I'm like, yep. And he goes, ah, Padres. And he points to his muscles. Flexes and points to his muscles. And then he goes, player. And I'm like, oh, okay. This is, a, this is a guy who plays for the Padres. Not thinking anything of it. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're 20 steps from the, from the Peoria Sports Complex. Makes sense. And I was like, oh, yeah, what's your name? And I couldn't quite understand him. And it sounded like he said, like, something Du Bois or something like that. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I got off at the third floor. I was like, hey, have a good night. And he looks me dead in the eyes and he goes, Anglais, malo. Like, like, <laughs> like bad, bad down, <laughs> malo. And I'm like, all right, man, see you later. I get back into the hotel room and I'm like, gosh, who was that? So I start looking. It was Leah Dulles DeVries, um, one of the Padres' top prospects, the top international prospect for the Padres this year, right? Uh, yeah. Is Ethan Salas still on that list? So Salas was last year. DeVries was like the number one this entire like international pool signing. He is their number fifth prospect. Got it. Yeah, so just, yeah, walked in. Rode the elevator up with the Padres, number five prospect. Didn't think a thing of it. Called Dude, it 17 in. years old. Yeah, what was I doing day. at 17? <laughs> I was, I don't know, sitting here playing video games, playing Call of Duty or something stupid, wasting my life. And dude was, yeah, 17 in an elevator. One of the top prospects for the Padres. Yeah, that was really cool. I felt like kind of an idiot after that. It's, it's okay. I, I, think, I think everyone will forgive you. It's a fun story. I, it's Act like, that won't. 
Actually, yeah, no, he he would never. <laughs> he'd hug the he'd hug it, you know, as the yeah. pro, as the resident prospect hugger. He's giving him a big hug. Right, right, right. So speaking of the prospects, I'd say your your most the thing you probably were looking forward to the most this spring was the big spring breakout game. And mm-hmm. as everyone knows, the first game did get rained out, but there's a second one happening on the 23rd, or I guess the, I don't know if it's rescheduled, if there was always going to be a second one. I don't really know, but it's, it's still happening on the 23rd, but obviously you are not there. Run us through your emotions on that day. So I knew that it was supposed to rain that day. And I thought to myself, if, if that game's going to rain out, like, that's it. That's it. I'm, I'm done. Like I'm, I'm, I'm done for. And, you know, we get to, um, I got to the backfields in spring training. That's when I met Cole and CJ. And uh, I was chatting with them a little bit. And we all went down to the backfields and met up, like, got an autograph from, like, Harry Ford. Um, and then we went and watched batting practice and watched guys like Lazaro Montez, Ty Pete, et cetera, hit. And, wow, that was something. And it was still pretty bright out. Like, it was still, like, sunny and not too cloudy. But you could see the clouds kind of moving in. When we got to the ballpark, we went inside and they had it roped off kind of down like the left field and the right field line. You guys may have seen uh, the Mariners Instagram uh, Mm. story that I was in. Um, That's where we were. And we were getting autographs from a lot of those guys. Ended up we ended up getting like Fellman and uh, Cole Young Uh, finally got Lazaro. It took a little bit, but we got there Um, a lot along with a lot of the other prospects. It was super cool to have them out there and signing. But you could tell it was starting to look a little ominous. And even then it was starting to rain a little bit and like it was getting on the ball and like getting on the piece of paper we had mm. to get autographed. And I was like, Oh no, like, and not then, like this. It's probably 20 minutes before game time. And it's just a torrential downpour. And, um, they pulled the tarp. They're like, it's going to be delayed. And so that was when I went and sat, um, or stood in the concourse. And for about an hour, I stood there while it rained praying that this game was not going to get canceled. Finally, they ca- they came on over the intercom and said the game's been canceled, and I died inside. <laughs> I I have been to spring training every year since 2020, and I have had at least one game rain out every single year. Really glad that was the one that rained out. Uh, that Arizona Valley just mm-hmm. not letting you you know stay winning. It's trying it's to pretty keep sunny the rest of the day, by the way. It's like for like what it rained for two. Two hours, maybe a couple hours, yeah, yeah, and then the rest of it was just good. Well, I'm not glad to be back from Arizona. I am glad to be spending time back in the normal setup because it was a doozy to get episode 69 of the Hit It Here podcast recorded. But hey, this was episode 70 of the Hit It Here podcast, presented by Bet Online, the Mike Ford episode of the Hit It Here podcast, as well as the Ty Adcock episode of the Hit It Here podcast. We appreciate you guys watching this one, and go Mariners.